Shalom from Jerusalem. This is Powers in Play, our monthly roundup of uh, global events. And uh, with us uh, today are three colonels in the reserve of the Israeli Defense Forces and one retired ambassador from the Israeli Foreign Service, Ambassador Dr. Chaim Karen, welcome. And Dr. Eran Lerman, Miri Eisen, and Ruven Ben Shalom, welcome to all of you. It's been more than uh, 10 months since the war in Ukraine started, with no end in sight. Perhaps the uh, harsh winter conditions um, in the battlefield and especially in the cities and towns of uh, the Ukraine will bring some halt to the uh, combat, but come next spring, it will probably Uh, be renewed in strength, unless diplomacy can take its course. Eran Lerman, uh, you have been uh, with the Israeli Military Intelligence Directorate and with the Israeli National Security Staff. We all know that uh, according to history and research, every war must end sometimes on some conditions. Is the Ukraine war ripe for such at least a cessation of hostilities, and perhaps a corridor towards compromise. Well, uh, there have been uh, in history things known as the Hundred Years' War, but this is not likely to last that long. Only our programs look as if they go on for such length. (laughs) Well, and and we have an Israeli-Palestinian conflict that can be traced for more than 100 years now, going back to 1920, basically. So... Uh, no, I don't think that the war, uh, this war can last uh, forever for two good reasons. First of all, there's a, a limit to Russian resources. And uh, if at all, um, Putin has been proven wrong in his most basic assumptions again and again. And therefore, the, I think the appetite in Moscow for the pursuit of this adventure uh, much further is fast fading. And I wouldn't be surprised if we are already uh, would hear soon about Russian feelers to the West, particularly to the United States, where uh, policy is conducted by two people who know very well the Russian situation, um, particularly the head of the CIA, Bill Burns, former ambassador to Moscow, knows the score reaching out to the Biden administration and asking them to see if they can turn Zelensky around on the question of negotiations. The other side, the other side of the same coin is that the full measure of what Ukraine aspires to, which is the return, the total return to the pre-2014 situation, including Crimea, including the Donbass, it's probably beyond Ukrainian reach, if only for the simple reason that these areas are no longer populated by Ukrainians. They are uh, majority, uh, not majority, but also totally Russian, uh, Russified. And at this stage, um, Ukraine can gain part, a significant part of what uh, was lost, Kherson, Zaporizhia. The Donbass and possibly Crimea are a different matter. So the, uh, the outlines of a possible point of equilibrium uh, is already visible. Uh, Ambassador Karen, uh, Russia um, is somewhat similar to Israel um, in, the, um, in that aspect, that uh, the senior professional echelon is uh, biased toward the military and uh, the um, high echelon of the intelligence community rather than to the uh, foreign service. But the generals and the intelligence uh, professionals uh, have failed miserably um, uh, come uh, in uh, February and uh, we can see it uh, in, uh, in late uh, December, early January. Where do the diplomats come in and is it really uh, the place for creative diplomacy. Can one find any formula uh, to get uh, both the Russians and the Ukrainians to agree 
on something on which uh, they seem hopelessly far apart. It seems that the uh, leader is dictating the policy. So whenever uh, somebody whisper on his ear that something is going wrong, he tends not to listen or to reject it by having a large scope of understanding in, in history and international politics, and not only diplomats, others too warned uh, the leader uh, not to do it, and later on some of them even um, took some measures, uh, resigned, uh, whatever, but uh, knowing the consequences, the international consequences of the story, but uh, I think Putin with his ideology, not only pre-1914, but coming back to the Tsar tradition and, her and heritage, would like to be an emperor at the time in history, so he tends not to listen, even I assume he was surprised badly by the ability of his army and so on. So uh, I just look carefully about reactions from uh, uh, states like uh, Kazakhstan to his requests or his usage by uh, uh, new countries that usually he used to help them like Iran or taking gold from Sudan in order to implement his policy in Ukraine we, it shifted to a new policy that diplomats definitely would reject. So, so a foreign minister like Sergei Lavrov, uh, who is a veteran diplomat, uh, he was elevated to his position from uh, ambassadorships. Um, it wouldn't really matter uh, if he were to be replaced. No, I don't think so. In that case, although he is very experienced, very knowledgeable, but uh, in that particular case... Uh, he needs to uh, to try to follow to easy or to make it uh, uh, the PR easier as much as he can, but not so, prevent it. So he is more uh, like uh, a Putin spirit, basically. Uh, Miri Eisen, uh, you're an expert on public diplomacy, and uh, we have seen that uh, both sides, but especially the Ukraine have put a lot of emphasis on public diplomacy. Uh, we have seen uh, Volodymyr Zelensky being interviewed uh, everywhere. He knows what to wear. Uh, there's sort of uh, uh, fatigues or, or sweaters um, uh, very fashionable now uh, because of him. Does it have any impact? Of course, there are many or several target audiences, but are the Ukrainians succeeding um, compared to their goals? The Ukrainians are Zelensky right now in the sense that the public diplomacy is run by him. It's not, we, we haven't heard of the Ukrainian people. We haven't watched the people of the different areas. You know, they don't interview somebody from Kiev, somebody from, you know, the different places. So Zelensky is playing a role very successfully. Winter has come. He stands in his winter clothes. He shows how cold it is. So here we are worldwide. We all feel for the Ukrainians. But I actually disagree a bit with my former colleagues and we're in powers and play because I think that Putin and Russia of Putin very much in that winter is coming are not just playing a part, but actually view themselves in the Hundred Year War see themselves as being in yet another stage of an endless war and are looking at Ukraine as the West. And, and, and in that sense, Ukraine, if it positions itself now in public diplomacy as the West, that's not going to help in the fight against Russia. But on its own way, it's backing not just the public diplomacy one, that the world is with it, but that the leaders are going to help them has a lot to do with their aligning themselves with the West, with the democracy, with the different ideas of the West. And I give it as a challenge, meaning for Ukraine to get the support it needs, it needs to be Western and Western supported. And as soon as they do that, which they're doing quite successfully, I think that they raise the red flag. I didn't even think of it in those terms certainly not communist anymore inside Russia, but that red flag in front of Putin and the Russians that look at this as an endless war against the West that is never going to end. Uvin Ben Shalom, um, you're a cross-cultural 
expert. Um, there are three basic um, uh, elements in such wars. The regimes, the uh, military, and the population. Um, are leaders in the Western countries wrong? Are they trying uh, to look at Putin and uh, the Russian military and the Russian population as a mirror image of their own societies and therefore fail to see how to reach a compromise? Because obviously they are not going in, they haven't gone in for a war of decision. They don't try to win over Russia decisively. They uh, are only waiting until Russia and Ukraine tire of it. I think we do that mistake. And always when we assess situations like this, uh, certainly a place like Israel, when we have this long conflict, 100-year conflict, and we tend to think that we have undercurrents, we have uh, complexities, we have uh, powerful national narratives going back even thousands of years, right? And the others, what do they do? These are skirmishes probably about this piece of land. He wants to annex this, he wants to annex that. And also we tend to see uh, as good and bad, right? So Putin's the bad guy here in the eyes of the West. What does he want from this independent Ukraine? I think first we have to accept that the sentiments there are deep, the concerns are real, and that Putin and so on. I'm not going to say who's right or wrong, but certainly Putin's uh, fundamental ideas behind this war are real, right? His concerns are real. His feelings are real. I think a lot of what's happening here and what's happening in the world has to do even with personal emotions. People are insulted. They want their honor back. The whole world, by the way, is working like that. China is rising because of that. And, and certainly, I think we have to look at that element. Yes, we do that mistake sometimes thinking that a popular vote, like in a, in a democracy, means they could overthrow the government. But in Russia, who cares what the people think? I, I, still, it does matter, and I think even Putin cares about that. And also, in Ukraine, I think what the people feel and think is important. Maybe the main failure of the war from the Russian perspective is that the areas that they wanted to annex, the population is shifting now, and they're opposing going back to, I think, maybe that's the biggest failure. They don't want to be part of Russia anymore, probably because of the atrocities, things inflicted on them. You see how the tide is changing from that perspective. It's almost like even if militarily Putin wins, if all the population, population say, we don't want to be part of you anymore, you know what? We're not, even, we're not even going to speak Russian anymore. So who won the war? And we are uh, all speaking in shorthand. We say the West. Yeah. Um, and now the West includes what used to be the East at least partly. Poland, for instance, when uh, it was uh, under Russian occupation de facto, we used to consider Poland and the other members of the Warsaw Pact the East. Now, obviously, it's part of NATO, but we see that there are problems between Poland and Germany, for instance, that uh, the NATO alliance um, is starting to show some in internal strengths. And even within the United States, um, having poured $20 billion worth of assistance to the Ukraine, there are shortages in ammunition, in military equipment, which might be needed, perhaps not tomorrow morning, but down the road uh, uh, on other uh, fronts. So perhaps the Russians can wait this war out and the West uh, will tire first. Well, to begin with, there is... The, the balance of resources is totally skewed. And the, the one advantage the Russians could have had was to take Ukraine by surprise, destabilize it, uh, get the regime in uh, or government uh, in Kiev overthrown. In their minds, it's a bunch of neo-Nazi Jewish fanatics. I don't know how that works. <laughs> uh, but but, uh, but and, and, and get it done with. Because in a long slog, Resources are what determine the outcome. That was the bitter lesson. I remember uh, General Amador giving this lecture to a group of Americans saying, you know, at the end of the day, who was the brightest of all American generals in history? And there was almost a total uh, uh, consensus. It was Robert E. Lee. And what happened? He lost. Why? Because the North had preponderant resources and the South didn't. Now, Russia... I, I was sure you were going to say, or quote, okay. draw that uh, General Motors and General Electric... <laughs> <laughs> that's the old... Yeah, they, that's, that's, trade, that's the famous Israeli joke. We'll trade you General Dayan for General Motors. But, 
uh, the, the, the Russian GDP aggregate is one in 20, 5% of the aggregate of NATO. So NATO doesn't, NATO as an alliance does not need to go, uh, you know, broke to retain its capacity to put constant pressure on Russia. Uh, once uh, the, uh, this current winter um, is over, and so far it looks as if the Europeans have managed to stock up enough to, to go through a pretty unpleasant winter right now, um, Russian leverages are going to disappear. But civilians there don't want uh, to uh, live in a wartime economy. Um, they may have um, enough, um, uh, obviously, in the West, the uh, standard of living is much higher than um, in both uh, Russia and uh, the Ukraine. But people don't want to give up their lifestyle for the Ukrainians. Probably, but uh, on the other hand, you saw also Germany, uh, uh, to use, a, to coin a phrase, you know, we, uh, I think it was uh, Kagan who said that uh, Europeans are from Venus and the Americans are from Mars. This was at the time of Bush 40, 43 going on adventures. Well, the Europeans have landed on Mars. They know what Mars is all about. Uh, I'm this, not sure I agree with you there at the all. The Germans are throwing 100 billion euros uh, into Money. their defense budgets. They're building their capacity. But they didn't sink in yet, and the population did not suffer the consequence in the civilian uh, walks of life. Well, uh, the, the, I think we need to... Uh, to, to see how it plays out during the winter. But here, this is where the Zelensky as a figure that people admire and do not want to see him fail yes. uh, kicks in in the, pol in the political dynamics in the West. Um, Ambassador Karen, Chaim, uh, you're an expert on, on Africa and Central Asia, so please prepare your defense while I ask Ruven <laughs> Ben Shalom. Um, to tie into what Iran said, but regarding the Far East. And because of the uh, rising Chinese threat, we have seen that in addition to Finland and Sweden uh, wishing uh, all of a sudden to uh, uh, enter NATO, Japan has shifted its defense policy and will now uh, be much more aggressive, much more militant, and will invest a lot in, um, in defense. Uh, does that reflect a new recognition by countries around the world that uh, the wars of the past are not only now present again, but because of the Chinese threat to Taiwan and to the entire uh, Far East, um, it may happen here? Well, if you ask me, then absolutely. I think all humanity now says, you know, everything changed. Uh, we were all going in a certain course after the Second World War, thinking maybe we can be sensible, uh, right? Wars are horrible. We can resolve things. Yes, there could be a few disputes. And now this sort of this shuffled all the cards. What this means is wars are back. Even saber rattling of nuclear, or they call it tactical, nuclear, nuclear weapons. M maybe tenfold of what we saw in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So like, everything's back. And I think all countries are now recalibrating, recalculating, thinking, you know what? We have no choice. We have to go back to survivability. By the way, our prime minister speaks about, our new, our next prime minister keeps talking about that. You know, uh, existence, right? We have uh, existential threats. That's the main thing. And I think all these countries are doing that. As far as, by the way, China and the Far East, I think what they see this here, in, the way, in a way, it's diverting attention, maybe even good for China. But also in that region, it's like a new bar was set. In a way, it's like 9-11 set a new bar for terrorism. So here it's a new bar for war. You know what? We can be aggressive. And more than that, everyone will respect us. The West can do nothing. And even China can calculate, looking at Russia now, if you use force, what will they do? Start a third world war. So, Chaim, um, you have uh, both uh, been stationed um, in, in Africa, um, not far from Israel, Egypt, uh, Sudan and you've uh, researched both Africa and uh, Central Asia. Um, we have seen uh, the Chinese and the Americans compete for Africa quite uh, assertively, perhaps even aggressively, 
and um, uh, President Biden, especially Secretary of State Blinken, um, have hosted 49 senior delegations from Africa uh, mm. recently. What does that competition for Africa and separately for Central Asia mean uh, generally and for Israel? Uh, the axis here is China, of course. I think China, for at least three decades, uh, is the power, the real power in Africa. I could see it on my own eyes. Wherever you go, although they declaring time and again that its main principle in foreign policy is harmony, uh, I could see how they functioning in uh, conflicts in Africa and what they doing, their abilities of construction and building everywhere. Uh, I could see it, uh, how they involved in conflicts uh, in between Sudan and South Sudan regarding to the oil, 7% of the Chinese oil coming from there. They cannot be, uh, they can deal only with harmony when they need this badly or uh, when they... Uh, using ports everywhere, and now in Central Asia, needless to say, the belt and the road. So uh, that's a leading force that I think no other country in the world can figure those kind of projects like the Chinese um, leading. they looking carefully on the image of Russia. On one hand, you're right when you, what you said about, uh, uh, okay, so what can be done against them. On the other hand, they were, in a way, surprised from the weakness of Russia. They expected for more, as well as our country. So Saudi Arabia and others. And still, when they compare the policy of Biden towards Russia, they tend to stay, in a way, with Russia and not keeping the line with Biden as MBS proved it in the last time, and he refused to give him more oil as he requested, and so on. So, and Africa definitely would like to see hard uh, evidence for uh, assistance, So, and that they can get only from China, and the credibility of Russia is still there. I remind you humbly that in the second wave of uh, the Russian uh, uh, invasion to Ukraine, uh, the deputy president of uh, Sudan came to Moscow to visit and to support Russia, in spite the fact that America is helping to Sudan in its economical policy. The, the Chinese are investing heavily in fishing uh, in Africa, but they are not fishing for compliments. They are fishing <laughs> for conflict. Yeah. You, you wanted to interject. They are, well, they are fishing yeah. for protein for the Chinese. I mean, and Africans are very often end up with the short end of the stick, and, and that has already led some years ago to riots in Mozambique. The, the Chinese policy right. has been quite crude in some places. I'm thinking of, of uh, something uh, that Lee Kuan Yew once said about uh, giving... Of Singapore. Of, uh, founder, f f founding father so of Singa modern Singapore, uh, that uh, giving the Japanese a military role in Asia is like giving brandy chocolates to an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> Not the Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> to the, Jap and, and, uh, to the, the Japanese, Japanese. Uh, the right. Singapore, and interestingly enough, you would not hear that language today, uh, not from Singapore, not from others. Uh, there's an interesting observation here. Um, 30 years ago, we were all informed by uh, Samuel Huntington of Harvard that this is a clash of civilizations. But in fact, what we are seeing here is the Russians fighting Ukrainians, and certainly come from the same civilizational uh, context. Russia would say that they are the same. <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> Israelis and Arabs are the same civilization? Uh, uh, there, there's ones. nuances. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you look at it from you, the middle, you, you, from you the find middle hybrids, West, you find hybrids on both sides. And, and uh, in, in Asia, uh, Taiwan and Singapore are uh, quite worried about Chinese expansion today. The Singaporeans are increasingly uh, on the Biden ledger. Uh, side of the ledger, uh, and and they if Japan and Australia and India can create a, a cord to contain Chinese ambitions, um, that's a welcome development. And all of them are watching the war, uh, and um, basically as a kind of dry run. It's a kind of 
uh, Ukraine would be for uh, for Taiwan what Spain was for Poland, if you draw the 1930s back into the game. Miri, what does it all mean for international organizations and uh, international peace forces? Um, Israel uh, has been at the forefront of uh, either hosting or bordering <laughs> Uh, such uh, forces uh, going back to 1957, right after the 1956 Sinai uh, Suez uh, campaign. But um, this entire structure is premised on uh, the leading powers of the world, the permanent members of the UN Security Councils, cooperating, having some common interests, and therefore wishing to keep the peace with the locals, the natives here, Uh, at least accepting those forces as tripwires, at least as pretext for their own populations why they don't invade their neighbors because there are UN forces there. What has happened uh, to, to that paradigm? Isn't it interesting that the first international force in that sense of the United Nations was called UNEF, United Nations Emergency Force. It's like that was the name that they thought of at the time. And you mentioned them as peacekeeping forces. And think of the distinction of what's happened with the United Nations, like the United Nations force in Lebanon, that interim force in Lebanon. But if you go into their website today and the way that they perceive themselves, they're not just a peacekeeping force, they're a humanitarian force. They're there to help the people interesting that's not what you think of nation you think building of in a way. nation building but of militaries being sent worldwide for which they were rewarded by two of the Irish uh, soldiers mm. shot mm. by shot Hezbollah by right. Hezbollah I'm putting that aside just for the moment in the sense that when we talk today you go but but Russia Russia's up there, she gets to veto. They're in that Security Council room, meaning that that room has vetoed itself out of existence. Nobody is going to impose something like that on Russia, so that it, to me, is something irrelevant. It would come back to perhaps, in that sense, diplomacy, where Russia would acquiesce, would understand that that's a way for them to be able to change. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't see Russia allowing that. You said that it's a playground in that sense of what it impacts the other places around the world. The United Nations right now is looking from the side, from the outside, and it is having no impact whatsoever. It's showing as soon as one of those five members is in the war, it makes the Security Council and actions there very, very improbable. And I think that that does have an impact on China. Okay, in that sense, and we need to be aware of that. So no expectations of international forces, except perhaps as face keeping forces in that world of public diplomacy. It's a wonderful way to bring it out to show something, but that's not going to be with the undercurrents. Could I take this one step sure. forward as far as the Please. mechanisms for the end? First, I think it's important that we acknowledge that Russia will not lose the war. Because They Russia won't. cannot lose the war. They will not. Okay? I agree. Um, we have to remember that as we're sitting here and analyzing from afar, human suffering here is in magnitudes that are really unbelievable. So it's not like a World Cup match, which <laughs> eventually <laughs> ends. Hey, you have Even to after, watch out. You don't know who's bothering right now. penalty shootout. <laughs> This can go on uh, without limits. And no limits, of course, okay. is what, well, what President Xi and President Putin I mean, that's well, because yeah, nobody but, appointed the referee. Right. But also here, Iran said in the beginning, you know, that he doesn't think this could go on forever. And I agree that these heightened uh, states of, uh, of clashing can't sustain forever. Uh, and this is a, an eight-year conflict. So I think it could, could go on longer. But I don't think Russia can allow itself to lose. Now, militarily, and most of us here represent the military, and this war means that the, we have failed, right? Humanity has failed because... In Israel, I think we tend to see wars. That's the main avenue of promoting your ideas. No, diplomacy is when we fail that and when we do a miserable job in that, that we have to kill each other, which is a stupid thing. Some of our wars were because we were horrible in diplomacy. So I think here, Russia will not back down. They're doing miserably on the ground militarily. All of us, all the world now has to rethink how you even build militaries, how you build intelligence, technology. And the one had amazing technology, but their technology fails. Like everything is reshuffled. I just simply think this is not going to end with a resolution that Ukraine wins. The diplomacy has to bring it that they both, both felt they win. All three of you have come up through the military. And Chaim, you have watched it. Uh, you came from the uh, foreign service. 
And um, in all of uh, the 75 years of Israel's existence, perhaps um, two prime ministers, Moshe Sharet and Golda Meir, had an extensive exposure to the uh, foreign ministry. Golda Meir was herself um, an Israeli emissary to the Soviet Union. And of course, Sharet built the foreign ministry, was uh, a foreign ministry official before the state uh, was created. And others have served as foreign ministers, it's Chak Shamir, for instance, but uh, they were not uh, diplomats. Um, on the other hand, you have uh, Itzhak Rabin and Ehud Barak and Ariel Sharon as professional military men who uh, have uh, achieved uh, the prime ministership. And the question is, following uh, World War II, we have seen democracies such as the United States with President Eisenhower or France with President de Gaulle. They have turned during their times of crisis to former military men. Uh, of course, we also had, especially um, in the Middle East, also in Latin America, which stayed out of the war, we had coups by military uh, juntas. How come right now we don't hear of military men going into politics in the great powers? Perhaps it is too early. But if wars are going to be um, a constant feature, do you expect military officers, and you've been in touch with, with many, of course, they retire at almost age 60. So perhaps it is too late for a second career. <laughs> but do you expect from your contacts with your colleagues uh, around the world that some professional uh, military men will be tempted to go into politics and try to lead their countries? First thing, the problem, our problem is thinking in military terms, but the problem is not military. The problem is, Miri, men. I think if we I was going to say men, 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 men. Men. But okay. That is the problem. If Absolutely. We had, if we had more women and not from military background, in Israel, by the way, we have a, the opposite tendency now. More talking about all, women, all men were born to women. Inclusion. Mm -hmm. Right. We're talking about more of inclusion of women in military aspects. Yes. The problem is now that the trend that we see on the ground and what it's leading us is opposite of what humanity should be doing and what in Israel we've been trying to do. I think here in places like Israel we have that natural tendency. Time and time again, we see that it fails. Because in general, these generals don't have a wide strategic view. They go to military might, which is only a tiny component of national security. Unfortunately, now, to answer your question, I think it's going to be a negative trend and we'll have to learn the hard way. Really? When I look around nowadays, one of the things that can really bug me is the patronizing way, as I sit here at my lovely table with my men, that we have a tendency to look at women leaders in the world nowadays, let alone young women leaders, where there's this patronizing, what do they know? And I go, wow, when Obama, who has no background in anything, he was the young hitman. But when it's these young women from European, New Zealand, etc., suddenly it's viewed in a very patronizing way. Um, I still think that there are going to be more military people who are going to come into the room. I do think that that will be a trend, that they do try to transfer. And I see it also inside Israel with that transfer of ex-military coming into our top politics. When I look at Russia or at China, I think that their systems are very, very different. And the reason I see that difference does have to do with a key word that I am going to embrace called democracy. Um, Russia is not a democracy. China is not a democracy. The the level, you would say, of a junta or of a takeover, but that's exactly the game that's played there. Putin comes from the intelligence community. He was the top of the intelligence community. He came out of the system from the strongest arm of that system in Russia. China is built in a vastly different way. So if you ask about in those areas, if we're going to see more military men, I don't think so. When it comes to here, I want to hope that we will have grown to the stage that we understand that decision making, that looking at these different challenges, including within war, does not have to do with gender or, for that matter, with military background. We have gone to the other extreme. We keep people in the um, incoming government not even having served in the military, not uh, even uh, being I don't. I don't have a problem with them because of that. I may have a problem with them for other reasons. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, yeah, please, hi. Uh, I think it's uh, even more than that. It's not only the matter of diplomats vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, military. It uh, uh, deserves now a thinking of uh, a wider thinking. You mentioned Huntington, and rightly so. 
about the change in the, in the world in terms of borders and identities. Now, even somebody who comes from sociology, understanding the deep change is the world going to, uh, to face now, that's important uh, because in, in a way you, your perspective is derived from that look, you can understand what will be happen, for example, in Central Asia after 30 years under the Soviets and then the changes now, what happened with radical Islam, which is a global by, um, by nature uh, there or in Africa, the means of the terrorism with all these policies, how you contain or fight or work with, depends. Uh, and that deserves more than only military thinking or even uh, diplomacy. You need to be smart enough uh, to come to identify where are the points that you can contribute and change uh, with the complexity that we now uh, concentrate in Russia and, and China, but we can see it uh, almost everywhere. If you saw yesterday how identities and spirits and legacies of Qatar, a very huge country, as you all know, uh, <laughs> with a lot of population, how they're using the opportunity to promote the image by arranging all of it. And in the end, in the, in the very, um, I, I, a very important moment they put on on Messi is the uh, the, the robe the mantle the, the, yeah the, the, mantle. the this this will fade uh, um, <laughs> there will be other events um, <laughs> okay but but, but, but images is important yeah I want to throw in a word for the soldiers um, in Israel almost consistently it was the soldiers who made the most radical um, diplomatic breakthroughs. Um, and if you look at the pattern, the Israeli military is much less gung-ho than, uh, th than some of the politicians who are trying to push them into battle. Uh, maybe the reverse was true in Russia because it, it became a completely inbred um, economic and, and power establishment. It's also the idea of, of, of getting your generals to go out and, and, and do something else at 45 or 50 is one of Ben-Gurion's greatest contribution to Israeli uh, social stability. But even in America, you think of Eisenhower. Was he a military president? He was very wary of you. He sent the CIA or all kinds of secret missions all over the world, from Iran to, uh, Guatemala. to Guatemala, right. to Indonesia, where he failed. But but basically, his, his, he was very, um, uh, at the end of his career, he was the one who spoke out against the military-industrial complex. And uh, from a position of military leadership, he understood the dangers of but military perhaps thinking. Perhaps what you said about Israel and you probably meant uh, Foreign Minister Dayan and Defense Minister Weizmann uh, being key players in Begin's acceptance of the Sadat initiative. And later and of course, Rabin and, Rabin. and Ehud Barak and, uh, and Sharon with the disengagement. But, These are people who understood that the solution was this not is, only military. This is because they knew intimately Israel's real relative strength, while others have uh, become convinced of their own propaganda. Um, as, as military, as Miri saw at uh, first hand. When so. we look at these different aspects, we really need to put on the table, when we say it in that way, Iran, it sounds so correct, they have done that, and yet at the end, it is very gender biased, and I live in a world today where you have to look at it broader, because it's bringing in a specific point of view, and we need to broaden that view. A final point for all of you. You've spoken about gender. Now, about age. Biden is 80. Putin is 70. Here, except for you, you're in your 30s. Uh, <laughs> we, we are all above the fold in, in uh, statistics, while most of the world is under 30. Is that one of the causes for what's happening in the world? Not because of Russia, but absolutely within the broader world. When we look into the challenges of China shrinking, of Russia shrinking, of the Middle East and Africa, oh, so growing, that's a cause. I think that the, the, cha the challenge is the gap between those leaders and between the people who are the immense population underneath. Proven. 
as far as age, you mean. <laughs> I think uh, I think if the young generation now would get up one day and say, why are we listening to all these old guys? We, you know, we're, look at all these countries we're talking about, the uprising in even Iran and China. That's my wish. And I, my next prime minister in Israel should be a 40-year-old woman. Mm. I think... Uh, anyone specific? <laughs> <laughs> I think the age and the technology are making a big difference now. And uh, it's a different world now. But it is not reflected in politics it and is. in international politics it, yet. It is. It is. It is because Zelensky's impact did not come through television or it came through uh, social media. It came through, he came up through television. He, he came up through television. But his ability to uh, mobilize opinion in the West was very much a function of the TikTok generation. So um, while we haven't agreed on a specific formula, um, solving all the world's problems. Nevertheless, we did advance uh, some ideas. And obviously, we must be ready for climate change too, a mental climate change. And I want to thank all of you, Colonel in the Reserves, Dr. Iran Lerman, Ambassador, Dr. Chaim Koran, Colonel in the Reserves, Mir Eisen, and Reserve Colonel Ruin Ben Shalom. And we will be back with another edition of Powers in Play, Next month, Shalom from Jerusalem.